um, in terms of policy and impact of industry on the uh, communities and environment. And Priyanka is a freelance journalist based in Mumbai. Uh, all three of them have extensive experience in dealing with uh, communities who have been affected by impacts of globalization um, and who, ha who traditionally have been dealing with uh, natural resources. So um, we'll, we'll basically go through um, <coughs> Yeah, so um, let's get started just uh, to get an idea of what we mean by globalization, environment, and democracy. Um, Kanchi, would you like to start off by giving some broader context of um, once your slides get loaded? So is it okay to get started though without us? Or do you want to do that? <laughs> Several years, Manju and I have been working on. Uh, we've gone through a, you know, our trajectory of really working with law and policy, uh, pre globalization, and then post globalization. So and then markets really opened up, different kinds of investments that we can do in there. And uh, so part of, of, of what I'm going to really talk about today is uh, the first part of uh, our work, and then Manju and I up subsequently, is basically. Uh, what has changed when it comes to the interface between industrialization and environment in India? Uh, and why some of the conflicts are uh, articulating, what they're articulating, why they're articulating. And it's, what, are the really what are the really difficulties? And so if we really start off around, uh, uh, if, we really, uh, if we really start off around, say, the early 1990s, where uh, the, there was a changing kind of changing nature of investments uh, in India that was being spoken about. There was large kind of large investments being, uh, uh, being, being invited into the country. Uh, there was a shift from certain sectors which were largely predominantly public sector uh, were becoming private sector, uh, mining, uh, power generation. These are traditionally, uh, you know, the, the, the welfare state really came into, into operation uh, during that time. Uh, it also... It also came along with, uh, you know, especially now, uh, where uh, governments are having to necessarily uh, uh, pit environment and, and industrialization <coughs> against each other, or social issues and industrialization against each other. So the question of trade-offs is really becoming a really big, big uh, issue post uh, post this. So you know, it's it's almost a it's almost a commitment that this is the way forward. And it's in this that, you know, the, the philosophy that helps some of us really understand what's happening is what is, and I, I was not very great with economics, but the few economic principles that I understood uh, was, this, uh, was this Kuznets curve, which many of you probably know. The Kuznets curve was basically used to understand when, uh, it, you know, when per capita income is increasing, uh, poverty will also increase. But once that, you know, once you actually arrived at accumulation of wealth in the hands of a few, you can use that wealth to sort out the poverty crisis. That's where charity comes in. Uh, 
the same principle was being applied in the environmental Kuznets curve, where as per capita income and industrialization growth trajectory increases, environmental degradation will increase. It's a simple curve like this. Environmental degradation will increase. The moment you have enough money in your hands, at the top of that curve, you will use that money to resolve the environmental crisis. So it's okay for ecosystems to be destroyed, people to be displaced, uh, you know, associations with land to change, uh, forests to be degraded, sea erosion to happen. When you have enough money, you'll be able to manage and restore it. But the problem with environment is that by the time you reach there, the ecosystems are all gone. The degradation has taken place. And that's the principle, whether it's in documents of the World Bank, or Government of India principles, it kind of helps you understand what is this commitment? What is this commitment to uh, uh, to growth that we are talking about? Thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so I've kind of spoken about this. We were here at, at the Kuznets curve. So it's as simple as that. You know, at, at, at that particular point of time, some particular point of time, we will reach there. We don't know what that would be, and there'll be different people who will define it. Uh, there was, there are, as I mentioned, there have been changing nature of investments and industrialization that's taking place. There's increased entry of private sector, and as of late last year, early this year, India has something called the Cabinet <coughs> Committee on Investments, which means no matter what processes you follow to understand social impacts, environmental impacts, if that process is taking longer or if it involves high-profile critical projects over 1,000 crores or anything that is critical, you can overrule all of that. All of that. It does not matter. Would you define MNCs? A multinational corporation. Thank you. Uh, so this cabinet committee on investment is, is now under transaction of business rules. Uh, so it's a special standing committee that has been set up, which clearly states this committee can intervene if our process of understanding environmental impacts is taking very long. Because it's coming in the way of the investment in the country. So those, those, it kind of is. A, it's a, it's a commitment that what is, what is really the priority? Uh, why, why situations are reaching, are becoming tense? And I'll speak about some of those examples specifically. It's because there are lots of pre-commitments. The moment a, a foreign corporation or an Indian corporation is getting into an agreement with the state government, there's, there's a, there's a, a pre-commitment. You've already signed a signed a memorandum of understanding to say, uh, well. We'll ensure all approvals for you. We'll get you the land. We'll get you everything. So I'm actually legally signing a document committing it prior to understanding the implications of this project in my area, whether it's a mine or an industry or these memorandums of understanding. Uh, Any one of you who's uh, this language is actually from uh, the MOU signed by Bosco. Uh, if you all uh, know uh, this South Korean major coming up in Odisha, uh, state of Odisha, with the uh, state government of Odisha. This is exactly from there. Largest FDI, big we can get into all the all the how important that project is. Memorandum of understanding. FDI is foreign delegated This this process of uh, speeding up things cannot happen project by project. So you cannot deal make it easy for each project uh, you know uh, gradually. What it requires is a process of judicial and regulatory capture. So you make the law in such a way that it will have a certain outcome. You make it easy, you make it industry friendly in such a way that it will have an outcome that is desired. So this process has is, is, happened and I think agencies, whether it is, uh, it, there's been a systematic uh, move towards making that happen. It has to go along with, and that's why when, when, when conflicts are coming up, you, you realize uh, things are so, uh, Things seems to be unresolvable despite all laws in place. Why are things going up, going on further, further? Because you design law in such a way. And I think I can, when we are talking, we can elaborate on some of these uh, things. It just should uh, you know, draw your attention to some of these points. It also comes along with which is will which will be dealt upon by other speakers. This necessarily means when you're pushing through projects, there is clearly forceful entry. There is what we call uh, corporate sponsored state executed repression. And you actually go through a process of constructing consent. You know, even if, they, if you, the country says, the law says you need to get consent, how do you make that consent possible? You, know, you, <coughs> you, force, you force entry of uh, basic amenities into an area. You close in so much from all sides that people are like, I'm getting choked. You know, 
even if I don't want to give up my land or I association with that area, I'm choked in so much from the side that one has no other way but to actually say yes to something. Uh, there are processes, political processes, that completely undo environmental arguments. Now, this is a quote from uh, one of the final approvals of the Jaitapur nuclear power plant, which uh, by the by Jairam Ramesh, our ex-environment minister, which very, he very clearly says, one is aware of all the environmental problems. One is aware that this destruction is going to be taking place, but for weighty strategic and economic reasons, you have to still go ahead with environment clearances. And this is the language that is coming in from our environment ministry. So. Cabinet Committee on Investments, weighty strategic and economic reasons, all are the, all these are reasons that are post-globalization really where, where you, you, you've committed to a certain kind of investment and a, and a what you call growth model. These are, these are the uh, ancillary kind of processes that go along making that possible. And in this, then there are these diverse socio-ecological articulations that come forward, uh, where, which, are, which are not purely environmental, but where environment and some of these these issues really uh, come up strongly, where people are articulating their uh, uh, their association with an area, or they 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 are not wanting to move out of where, where they are, and the reasons for that will be dealt upon much more in, in subsequent. Uh, so there are where environment is not is actually life and livelihood, and I'm, this is this is a, this is a picture of uh, one of the areas we are very closely working in. This is Rang Bandar, a fishing harbor in in uh, Gujarat state where the fishing community here is actually really strongly uh, uh, coming out strongly against thermal power plants because they have seen what is happening around them. You know, it's, it's, it's a classic case of where industrialization has kind of moved in and these are the two fishing harbors which are, which are pretty much located where it's slated for development or slated for industrialization. Development is such a loose term, uh, but it's, you know, industrialization and in, 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 through such a development. So there is a resistance that's going on which is where the articulation of environment comes through the strategic articulation of life, livelihoods, connection with the ecosystem. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing narrative of, uh, this, is, this is an area where do, they do on-foot fishing, they actually go, this is an intertidal area, they actually go walk into the sea and hook, you know, hook in the tidal area and bring, bring catch fish. There's uh, a small fort, artisanal uh, fishing, etc. that's taking place. A huge amount of Bombay duck fish comes from here. Huge amount. It's, it's, it's an amazingly vibrant uh, area. Uh, it's, it's, so the, the picture there is about, uh, it's, it's, it's mainly about um, uh, the fishing. Uh, it's also an act, the, 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 the coastal front is an activity which is not just for fishing, it's, it's net making, it's, it's a whole life and livelihood is really revolves around uh, these areas. And if thermal power stations, ports, etc. come up, this is kind of just going to change this entire scenario. And this, with all those considerations of weighty strategic, economic, political reasons, not really environmental or social. These are just some quotes, I'll let you just read them. Uh, and this is the other side of the area which they've already seen transformed. So the picture that you see is actually, the, the picture in the middle is actually where there was mangrove around. It's dried up. Uh, OP Gupta Power Company, as simple as that. So, it's a Chennai based company which is just coming up with uh, uh, coming up with a thermal power plant. Uh, another scenario where the articulation of environment comes out very strongly and not necessarily always, uh, uh, always it, it's a strategic argument of using culture and identity uh, as. as uh, as articulations say that we do not want this kind of land use change in, in an area. And this is where we travel to the state of Sikkim, where the, the Lepcha tribal community is actually very clearly when they're objecting towards hydropower plants in their area, uh, they're talking about indigenous identity uh, alongside the whole other set of uh, environmental uh, issues, social issues, etc. So it is coming through that, you know, the, the notion of environment is coming through this whole notion of uh, uh, culture and identity. Uh, the picture up there is a picture that Manju took, I think, back in what, 2003? Back in 2003, when a large number of uh, hydropower plants were actually slated up in Kritista, this was the only bridge that connected the village on, on the, the right-hand side to the other side. 
And what you see, the hillock on, 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 on in front is actually the dumping of a of a, you know, a tunneling of the hydropower plants, which the muck that comes out, they've dumped in there, has broken the bridge. The other side is the forest. This side, the hill, actually, is the muck from that tunnel of uh, the Tista uh, 3 hydropower. Tista 5. Tista 5. A similar, similar case, much later, uh, on the Tista. And when people there, this is, this is the kind of, uh, you know, articulation that you're they're, they're coming out of all of the open. It's actually re-engagement with the identity to say this, you know, this area belongs to us. Uh, it's that kind of, now we might agree or disagree with that articulation, but for it, it becomes a tool for people to actually also very clearly say, you know, we are, our, 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 whole, our whole identity and ethos is connected with this area. So, you know, when you talk about environmental impacts, it's got to do with, uh, nice. <laughs> So when you talk about environmental impact, it's also articulated those, through those principles of culture and identity uh, that's coming up. And they've, they've, they've actually negotiated politically uh, that so, so dams should not come up upstream. There's been constant tussle and negotiation with the government saying, well, uh, let's do a carrying capacity study. And then the carrying capacity study actually happens to say, you know, no dam should come up upstream. <laughs> then there'll be a committee, expert committee that will be set up. And the expert committee says, no, no, actually two out of the three can be allowed. It's all like constant negotiation uh, yeah. That picture was talking about fundamental rights and freedom of religion, and you were talking about uh, the power plant or the hydro, hydroelectric plant. Yeah. I mean, how, is, how are the hydropower plant is actually coming up in the Zongu area, which is, which is where it is the traditional habitat of, this, of the Lepcha people. And that would mean that people would not be staying there anymore. Uh, there will be two things that will happen. One, a lot of the land will be diverted for other kinds of use, which is construction of the, I don't, the, the, the powerhouse, etc. The other, uh, the fear, is the fear of when the moment there's a power plant that's being constructed, there are lots of outsiders who come. So there's labor from not so pretty areas of India that would come in. And that's, that's, the, that's the cultural politics of, that, that plays out. That is the outsider insider thing, I think, which Manju will be dealing with much more. Uh, when she speaks about it. Can I just add yeah, sure. Zongu is actually a place that was, uh, it was almost like a, it's like a reserve uh, that was, uh, which was uh, done through a legislation during the time when Sikkim was an independent kingdom. This is prior to 1975, when, which is when uh, Sikkim got annexed to India. I mean, there are different versions of how this happened. Some of them say that it was done with, uh, with uh, much stealth and many of them were really upset about it. But th these were the kinds of protections that, uh, you know, indigenous communities had from much earlier on, which now sort of might get watered down or might get threatened because these are now seen as secular spaces where development will come in, a certain kind of development that has been able to provide, uh, you know, certain facilities in other parts of India and now need to be done here as well. So, you know, they, they, they sort of speak about this place as their own sacred space because they say that uh, their deities are in the trees and rivers and, and all of that stuff. And so any kind of construction in this place threatens, desecrates, uh, desecrates the place and threatens the way they, they sort of relate to it. Uh, this, was, this was part of the articulation. It's, it was actually there was at one level a strong uh, assertion of identity, and at another uh, level there was the youth actually did a uh, indefinite fast. Uh, use it, use means like satyagraha to actually say that and negotiate. And they were part of the community who negotiate while the satyagraha was going on. They were negotiating how many power plants should go through, how many, how many not. That was one side of the whole story, and the other side, they actually did about almost 200 days of uh, relay fast. Uh, and Baba was was there in the picture. He was very much part. Of leading that. Uh, there's also another reality where there is impending uh, and there is there is uh, what we witness today when India, it's, it's, it's where the, the, the impacts of nation building are currently being felt. This is an area called Singroli uh, in uh, the states of Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh where in the 1960s and the 1970s dam building, thermal power stations, mining, all public sector undertakings had initially started. 
This is what is called the energy hub of India. Every few kilometers there is, a, there is either a mine or a dam. And there are people here who have been displaced thrice. So it's, 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 this is the Uttar Pradesh side. And then now Madhya Pradesh side, is, it's all, the whole set of things is being repeated. And repeated now no longer with the public sector. It's no longer the public sector that is really telling you this is all part of nation building. It's all private sector. Uh, it's it's all of you. You name the big corporation, in, Indian, Indian, big Indian corporations. They're they're there every every few kilometers. There's not an inch of space you can really stand on where you can say, oh, can I stay here or can I farm here or no? No matter where you move, you're going to be moved again. It's it's, it's bound to happen because every every inch of space is slated. Uh, this is the kind of uh, this is what we've seen from the 1960s and 70s. This is Chilikadar village. That's Anpara village. That's a mine overdump right there, right next to the village, for years. For years <coughs> on it. And this is what, this is what people are saying, you know, that you actually, so basically, first they actually settled, resettled us here, and then other projects came around us. So we actually have achieved it, because the moment you say, you will be rehabilitated and, and, and put in, in another area, you, you, there's an, this, that area is actually slated for some other change. So you, you know, there, there, there's no permanency in that, uh, in that, uh, in that whole thing. And the second thing is actually about on that mine overdump, there's supposed to be afforestation, right? This is your mitigation and man management strategy. The moment you do a mine overdump, you afforestation. These are thorny shrubs that are that are really coming up, and it's very simple when they say, you know, I mean, you 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 never ne neither can solve the pollution problem, neither can there be breeze if you actually have thorny shrubs on that. It's a simple, simple thing, and there is no. Uh, it's, it's a simple articulation of what people are living in right now. I have a question. Uh, is this a concept of compensation, or, or is there some entity that's that's uh, independent that negotiates between the various folks, or how does that happen? So, some of depending on the kind of approval it is, yeah. uh, <coughs> there is different agencies. So, the responsibility is of the project authority. So, if I if I get if I get a mining clearance and I have to do mitigation, so I have to do afforestation. Mm -hmm. Or I need to ensure that the muck is dumped properly. Uh, these are these are huge issues of compliance that that uh, that have to be dealt with in another long discussion. But it's the primary responsibility is of the agency. The monitoring responsibility is of the state. I'm talking about uh, compensation for the yeah. people moving here, the land uh -huh. acquisition, because that should somewhere be between the government and the corporation, right? It is. So the, the, when when uh, in Anpara people were moved, they were given these six by eight houses. Okay. And very interestingly, when public sector uh, compensation really takes place, you get the house, but you can't sell it. So now, many of them are actually stuck because they can't even sell anymore. And families have grown. So we're talking about 1970s now. And in that same space, uh, there are many more. Uh, I'm, I think, eating up too much of the time. So I, I yeah. One more question. What, what are the 658 houses? Oh, all this. Yeah, it's Dimensions. So anyway, I'll uh, quickly wind up so that we can come back to this. Probably. Probably. So we can go and see what it is. It's probably just, uh, it's probably about half of where this side is. It's a really small space. Uh, yeah, so basically, the, 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 where all these really come up, and people say, you know, what do we do about this? You know, there's, there's cultural problem, there's livelihood problem, uh, there's, you know, issues of our rights, all these kinds of things. What can you do? Why? We can compensate for it all by a price. We can buy off your forest. We can pay you off. You know, everything can happen. Now, most of the policy spin is on. on how you can actually pay off. And in that process, there is, and we'll delve, we can delve deeper into it, there have been systems of compensation that have been created through long policy. Very clear system. So the moment you say, I have a concern, it will go in as part of condition that we we'll take care of it post, uh, post the thing. Uh, you're going to destroy mangroves, don't worry. We pay the forest department to plant mangroves somewhere else. That is the system <laughs> of compensatory afforestation. So that, you know that it's it's actually now institutionalized. Earlier people would talk about it. Now it's part of the institutional framework. It's a it's a systematic thing that you could do it. 
And then the whole issue of compliance is a different ball game in India. You, know? you, you don't even don't you can spend two hours next two hours just discussing instances of non-compliance. A lot of what uh, we saw in Singroli is non-compliance. When there is uh, this dumping taking take place, fly ash that's being dumped right next to the uh, villages. When the when the clearances would say you should not build a power plant right next to your community, this is all this is all parts of the non-compliance thing. Uh, and predominantly, uh, it's not it's not like when you're judging whether whether uh, environmental and social impacts are going to be high. You don't say yes or no. It's all yes, but <laughs> it's yes, but we can deal with all the uh, all the problems. It's like all the mitigation and management strategies are listed. There was one last project, the OPG, OP Gupta. It was, it was a negotiation of one year between the state government and and the corporation, and it was listed with 131 conditions, including this, uh, saying when you build a desalination plant, you will not destroy mangroves. Wow, how can it be possible? When you will build it, you will necessarily destroy the mangroves, or you will necessarily, I mean, you know, just lying through your teeth. Uh, and I'll just leave us with this last thought, uh, and hand over to my colleagues, and relax. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for the that uh, great context about how all these different things uh, come together. So uh, Priyanka has been working in some of these areas where this kind of environmental impact, social impacts of the corporatization of the land and livelihoods have been taking place. Uh, so uh, so um, Priyanka, if you can talk about some of the uh, specific instances where, where how communities have been affected, particularly in the context of that uh, corporate corporate-sponsored uh, state executive repression. Uh, hi. Um. As you might have seen in some of the photographs, I mean, Kanchi is definitely, it's not working, why am I standing here? <laughs> um, it's okay, yeah, I'm loud. Um, I have been traveling to these places to see what's the other side of development, as you might call it. So uh, it has taken me to various places to see uh, what's been happening, and these are primarily places which you may not have heard in the mainstream media which made me become an independent journalist because the mainstream media has its priorities in different places, in places like what Kanchi has spoken about in, in, in painting a beautiful picture of, uh, of development as we might be able to see it. Um, these are stories and instances that I would tell you about and I, and I want you to join the dots between what's happening there on ground, I mean the result of this, this idea of development that we have uh, connected to the broader framework that Kanchi has spoken about, and perhaps also look what's been happening across the world, also in this country. There have definitely been instances of that. Um, Watch A Delhi-based and a DC-based organizations together, they came together and they did a survey. Uh, you can look it up online since we don't have internet connectivity here, but it's called Society for Promotion of Wasteland Development, SPWD, along with Rights and Resource Initiative based in Washington, DC. They came up with a study where they surveyed, uh, where they were trying to find out conflicts related to land disputes. You would be surprised to know that of the 602 districts that we have in our country today, 130 of them have conflicts going on, just among themselves, in that whole notion of state-sponsored, corporate-backed violence just so that your land can be taken away from you. That's one-fourth of our country is literally going through a civil war in the name of development. And these are the stories. The person on uh, uh, with the brown jacket, he was about 
just about a toddler or just, you know, had started walking just at a time when India was gaining its independence. He lives in an area which, let's play this as a game, he comes from an area which a certain corporation has done a lot in nation building efforts and a city is named after that same corporation, right? So he was displaced from his land because we had to build our nation and as Nehru had said that temples, are, we have, dams are the temples of modern India, they had to be displaced because a dam had to be built. They received a compensation of 5,000 rupees then. To my limited understanding of economics and inflation, I still think about 5,000 rupees or just about $100, even 65 years ago, is not enough sum for someone to live off as, as, as a long-term compensation. Now he grows up to be a young man. He gets a job with that said company because that company has definitely you know, risen up the nation and that is the heart, uh, heart, heartbeat of how what development has been there. He manages to get a petty job, although his skills are just as a farmer like his parents have been. But now the company realizes, along with the government, that now we have to build roads there because it's a dam, so it has become a tourist thing in that area. So he's displaced a second time. Compensation, well, we paid you the last time, right? So don't ask for compensation again. Now he has his own family, and that's his son. That's when they realize, oh, it's a dam. It's for irrigation. We had forgotten that we need to have canals built. So he's displaced once more. So, so it's, it's on a hill slope that he went on moving upward, and then he continued to be displaced three times. Any idea of which city and which company I'm talking about? Jamshedpur. Jamshedpur, Tata. Everyone looks at Tata as definitely one of those companies which has been very instrumental in nation building, but it's come at a huge, <coughs> huge, huge human cost. This lady is Sumi Kalundia. I met her in June 2010. In May 2005, which you understand would be what a hot place in the state of Orissa, as, as it is almost everywhere in India at that time, uh, in, in that particular part of the year, uh, they had been hearing that the cops would come every day, early in the morning, intimidate the people, and by afternoon they would leave, just about around 3, 4 o'clock. So this was supposed to be almost the same day. They had heard that the land was to be taken away for, for some big project that's coming up. That particular morning, to the cops had come, and they thought that they would leave in some time. She was busy filling water uh, 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 through a hand pump very close to her house. But they also heard some gunshots, and they heard that it's not one of those typical days. So she flee from the place along with the men. So the women had fled to another place and the men to another place. And they thought they are going to come back home late in the afternoon, like the cops would leave. But the cops did not leave for about two, uh, for about a day and a half. When she comes back home, she sees that her one-year-old daughter, along with the two-year-old son of her uh, brother-in-law, are both lying dead on the cot. They died of hunger. They died of dehydration. They were not shot to death but then they, they, they died of a different bullet. During that gun firing that had taken place two days ago, one man had died. It was a day when Maharashtra seen this, a steel plant, uh, uh, this, uh, a company which has steel plants, was trying to acquire that land and they were having the Bhumi Pujan or the groundbreaking ceremony. When it got messy and bloody, and that's not how corporations like to get into it, you know, I mean, it's like a lot of dirty work after that, they left that 1,500 acres of land that they were supposed to take. Who took over the land? Tata. Tata already had 3,500 acres of land that they had earmarked for themselves. And once Maharashtra seamless left it, they acquired that too. This is a place called Kalinganagar. Kalinganagar is a place that many of you, I'm sure, may not have heard. If you have heard, I apologize for, uh, you know, your uh, this by supposed naivet about your knowledge, but it's a place where when I tried to write in Times of India, before I went in there, my editor had asked me that, why do you want to go there? And as an independent journalist, I just wanted to go and spend time there. Well, I began to explain, well, you know, this is a place north of Bhubaneswar, uh, it's a district called Jajpur, and uh, it's Kalinganagar, where Tata has acquired 5,000 acres of land, and sweetie, wait, don't go ahead. If it's against Tata, we can't write anything about them. It's as blatant as that. It's not even in those one mysterious ways, you know, where as a journalist you file your story late at night and you're happy that next morning your 
play would be on parade for a nice story that you thought that you that one of those ten stories in which you were convinced about and wrote about. It's it's not as and but it gets dropped mysteriously next morning. It's not as mysterious as that. Write about sweet tribals and the tribal life, but we cannot touch Tata. And Tata is just one of these things. Why am I talking about Tata? Because all of you, when all of us have grown up thinking, Tata ka namak khaya hai, a goli bikhaye. This is what's happening. I was not allowed to write in any of the media, what is Tata doing? When you ask the locals, what is, um, what's the extent of Kalinga Nagar? It's not a earmark SEZ, special economic zone, or a special investment region. But it, it was something that was created early on in the 90s, along with the, with the then uh, Pichu Patnaik government. <clears throat> so when I asked the locals who have been you know, trying to defend their land, and these are the whole Munda Adivasis, and I asked them what's the extent, they are like, we don't know. Because every now and then, every few months, we see that the extent has been increasing. That's another steel plant here at Mark and Cub. Uh, there is one of the photographs there, in the first photographs that I've put up, where uh, the one which is kind of a blue sky and you have the steel plants up there. Um, uh, it's very interesting how now when I speak to the people, I know that right in that place from where I photograph, I cannot be photographing it because there have been big tin you know, fences that have come up. Interestingly, around the same place when I was meeting this woman, who, uh, who, uh, who, who was a resident there, who had been attacked. She looks far away and she says, you know, I have, we have never ever had electricity all our lives, so many years of independence. We don't have a single electric pole. But can you see that far away? That's my land. Can you see that? That's the steel plant. And it's running 24 by 7. I won't even get a needle out of it. This is also the place where in early 2006, 14 people had died. And how they do it? It's because they managed to uh, lure some of the locals, either lure them or coerce them into taking compensations. And then they are then sent in to come along with the bulldozers, along with the, with the government officials to bulldoze on the other person's house who is not complying to give his or her land. <coughs> this is the whole war that we're talking about. Another example is this, not very far from Nagpur. This is a dam called the Ghosikur Dam that's coming up. And you know, as journalists sometimes, we really cannot write about the same thing over and over and over again. That's how we are told, that people are bored. Let's talk about what, which new dog Paris Hilton has, you know? I mean, let's just find out what's going on in the relationship between, I mean, is Karina Kapoor pregnant yet? Not yet, she's married, it's been so many months, that's what they're interested in. But not this, because it's boring, we've had dams go on and on and on. You would find the numbers on Google that dams have been the greatest, uh, the large dams have been the result of biggest numbers of displacement in independent India. So this is not far away from Nagpur, it's in Kosikur, uh, Kosikur Dam has resulted in some kind of displacement. Amazing kind of agitation and resistance by the people that please let us be and don't take away our lands. But some of them have been displaced. This old man is a master ji, and the master ji, as you would know, a school teacher in India is quite revered. And he was not someone who let it down. But he has a small patch of land now. Only all that he has is just a, a kitchen garden. And the only possible story that I could pos uh, that I could pitch to the news media was this paragraph that because of displacement, because they are next to a big city, because the expectation is that they should know English, because the expectation now is that they should have computer jobs or good paying jobs, because these men have been displaced, they don't have land, and his son would have none of it, no father is ready to give his daughter in marriage to men like his son. So here you have a village of all single men who are just not finding eligible women to marry because because nobody's going to give them in, in marriage because they really have nothing. Perhaps that would get a mainstream media's attention to write it. Maybe. I mean, it would have to be a very sexy kind of headline. But that's why you just not get to hear these stories. In 2006, our prime minister had declared Maoists as a single, uh, single most internal security threat to the nation. That's exactly the same time when the state of Chhattisgarh, Salva Judu, a vigilante militia was started to clear out this quote-unquote menace of Maoism. 
That's also exactly the same time some of the biggest numbers of MOUs were signed and a memorandums of understandings. And some of the biggest companies, the, uh, some of the biggest MOUs that were signed bringing in a lot of investment were SR and Tata. So, Salva, and there have been some papers which have said that, uh, that definitely it's like funded by, you know, by these corporations. It's amazing how when I went there to report, after 10 days of reporting, even before when I was not done with reporting and blogging about it, there was one day where the place where I was staying, the electricity was shut down. Uh, the, my blog was inaccessible, and cops had come to beat us up and take away our camera. It's amazing how in a place which has so, so much uh, malnutrition, you have cops which are really big in size to beat us up. These things are just, you know, you just cannot connect them, but perhaps you can connect them because it's all a blur. I'm going to stop talking here, but I would request you later on to also please take a look at the photographs that I've put up which is talking about this whole human cost of development, as, as we might call it. And what uh, do we really look at it as development after this cost uh, uh, people have to pay? Finally, it all boils, all boils down to this. The Indian government, and definitely the Indian public, who are you know uh, uh, enjoying the fruits of this idea of development, feel that some humans are more equal than the others. Think about it and then conclude. Thank you. Thanks, Priyanka. Um, so it seems that all this, the resistance is very complicated business uh, because the people who are resisting and people who are being resisted against are all same people or you know, from the same country. Uh, Manju, would you like to actually talk about how this post globalization resistance has been? <coughs> Why is it even more complicated? I'm old fashioned. I just call it who will use paper and pen. I've actually had conversations over all these years with several people who are part of AID, but I've never actually met anyone till today. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really happy to be here. Uh, AID has been a long time uh, active partner of our work almost uh, since we began, since Kanchi and I began working on environmental issues. Uh, and uh, with your questions and doubts about our projects, our methods, and strategies, You've uh, not only kept us on our toes, but sometimes also made us stand on our heads. <laughs> uh, we've had some, you know, intense conversations uh, when we've had questions from uh, some of the eight chapters saying, why would you want to do this and not something else? And we've had to like sit for two, three days and figure out what those arguments <coughs> might be and then send back an email or have a Skype conversation. Uh, so in the 10 minutes given to me, and I promise I'll try my level best to stick to it, because I'm interested in the discussion that's like uh, I would like to give a context to our work, and by our work I mean the work of environmental researchers and environmental activists who are constantly documenting all of these problems, but also have to find out ways about what to do about this. What do we do about this? Uh, and uh, so I would like to suggest that there's every reason for uh, all of us to be very skeptical of anyone who claims that they've gained any success in, an, in working on environmental issues, or anyone who offers a particular, uh, a particular kind of living that may be environmentally positive or environmentally friendly or whatever that is. Uh, for a few years now, I've found it almost impossible to narrate any story as a linear set of events, any of these cases. I mean, there, because there are so many other smaller stories that are that are sort of hidden in these larger pictures, uh, and without telling them, somehow the the picture does not seem complete. Uh, having chased many of these environmental development conflicts that no doubt have fallen more heavily on some groups of people than others, I find it hard to ignore the many debates that take place.
through these conflicts about what is right and whose right is most important. This makes it rather impossible to speak about environmental issues in broad, overarching terms that assumes that nature means or should mean the same thing to everyone. Um, I'm sure that as this ambitious uh, series takes off, much wrestling will be done with these big words, uh, globalization, democracy, and the different experiences of the presenters will also give us quite a collection of uh, definitions and meanings of nature, sustainability, and environmentalism. But uh, as my modest role in this series, I just want you to discuss today with you about why the experience of globalization makes it particularly hard and, and uh, puts up certain kinds of challenges on how environmental work is to be done and talked about. I've put down three ideas to last 10 minutes or so, but I'm sure there are, there are seven more, and I think from, from what we've heard from the two of them earlier, I think we can list seven more. The first is about culture. Culture, I find, is no longer a reliable ally for environmental work. Globalization has resulted in so many and such quick changes to what we have called and identified as the local community. Processes such as migration have changed the composition of people, their, of, of these communities, their beliefs and their worldviews. It's getting harder and harder for everyone to differentiate between insiders and outsiders without dangerously leaning on conservatism. In such times, to rely too much on any seemingly homogenous group to shoulder the environmental cause or privilege them as the natural custodians of land or forests uh, may produce more injustices than eliminate them. New migrants, especially the poorest ones like Dalits who may come to cities looking for work and fleeing atrocities in their villages, or the tea tribes, say of Assam, um, and refugees like Bangladeshi laborers um, in India can almost never participate in environmental movements which are premised on traditional ties to land. That's because they have no traditional ties to land in, in, in that country. A challenge to new environmental movements is about how to jettison the idea of a static community and include new actors and their aspirations when we critique development programs and projects. The second strong ally that many environmental groups and activists have is law. Our uh, environmental laws were made in the 70s and 80s, almost all of them that we speak about today and we use actively in our activism today, they were all made between the 70s and 80s. During that time, the powers of the center were far more than it is today. Uh, I'm, I'm just presuming that all of you are familiar with uh, the political structure of India. Um, when a single party was, when a single party holding a clear majority was in power during this period, 70s and 80s, many environmental laws may have been legislated. But in the last two decades, it's become clearly clear that the central government has found it almost impossible to have the state governments implement these laws. Powerful regional parties with popular majoritarian mandate run these governments, these state governments. And they've left no effort untried in attracting investments and chasing industrialization without stopping to pay any attention to impacts whatsoever. And you've already heard the stories of how, uh, <coughs> how brazen these uh, uh, efforts at gaining uh, investments are. Centralized environment law, it seems to us, I mean, definitely to Kanchi and me, I don't know about others, it seems to us is extremely compromised and quite incompetent in these times where cowboy-style regional politics rule the show. For those of you who are familiar with, I, I, I mean, I think you should take a look at it, uh, although I should be the one saying this. For those of you who are familiar with our research on non-compliance of environmental clearance conditions, and Kanchi sort of referred to this, the performance of all states in achieving compliance is really dismal. Yet we spend enormous amounts of time, by the, I mean, environmental activists and researchers, we spend enormous amounts of time in tiresome litigation that have little gains, but we've been extremely hesitant to engage with powerful provincial governments. One reason for this may be that they do not speak a secular, modern language of environment and sustainability, but they are more interested in issues of caste and religion-based politics. That These topics make uh, most progressive environmentalists very, very queasy. The, the third aspect, and this is the last one that I'm going to talk about, 
third aspect that has cleared the field and introduced much complexity to environmental issues and therefore to environmental responses by all of us is technology. That is not only technology in manufacture and construction, but technologies of gathering environmental data. You could keep in mind the BT Brinjal debates that happened in India last year and on which we are still to hear the final wording. New methods and models to understand and capture the true state of the environment are given much greater weight in environmental decision making within the bureaucracy or courts over social and political possibilities. This reliance on technical knowledge about the environment to solve or manage environmental problems poses such dilemmas in determining questions like which country should do what to combat climate change, how much coal mining should be allowed and with what kinds of credits, or why a few nuclear projects may be better than many dam projects. These are the kinds of ways in which the environmental questions are actually being posed. The interconnections between technology and environment continue to get more and more befuddling each day. It's become a supra-technical field now, and we cannot do without domain experts who understand, elaborate, and decide on these issues on our behalf. So every process of environmental decision making today has been assigned to groups of experts <coughs> who enjoy the privileges of exercising their expertise without necessarily being affected by the risks. This has become a bone of contention for most activists and groups who have worked to strengthen decentralization and participatory governance on the ground. So then with, without these allies, what do we actually have? For the largest democracy of the world, the greatest challenge today is to create and maintain spaces and opportunities to talk, discuss, debate, and even provoke on matters of environmental development and justice. We do not have the luxury of holding on to any fundamentalist views about nature or what we should do with it if we are to embrace democracy. The state, on its part, needs to offer us those spaces to realize democratic values. We are all adults, after all, and with more and more of us going through school, and by this I mean <coughs> all categories of people, whether you take tribal communities, you take farmers, you take Dalits, whatever, the number of people coming through school is only increasing. We are a huge nation of literate adults. We need to find ways by which different values, aspirations, and anxieties can be freely aired and considered with importance and pragmatic decisions taken that lie somewhere between all of these views. With more minds at work, imaginative ideas for the future are bound to emerge. The process is very important. It will make us feel alive and responsible not only for our words and actions, but for our lives and the lives of other people. If we, it will allow us to hold on to hope that we may be able to live the life we aspire to in future time and not rot in some archaic category that's been assigned to us by the census. If our democratic institutions can make each one of us feel this way, we may not see the paternal state using violence in the name of citizens, and we may never need preachy environmental activists. <laughs> went through this conflict between science and religion in the 1500s, 1600s. So what India is experiencing right now is nothing new. So that's, that's a <coughs> fundamental question. And the conflict is going to go on forever, religion versus science. The second part is it's the, you know, the question of scale over technology. At what point do you, I, I, is there going to be a, a, a turn in the curve? So I'm just wondering, is, is, because I think one of the, the main aspects is, is the government. Is, are the decisions transparent in the sense that uh, you know, the decision-making process, unless they tell you what, how they weight each decision and what the priorities are, you're going to get a different response. And that's where the different communities actually disagree, right, how they weight each thing. So uh, are these decisions transparent or, or is it an ad hoc? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, decision process that you have in India? Okay. Uh, some laws put out a process that need to be followed, which is supposed to be transparent, uh, which is supposed to have, like the environment impact assessment process is something called a public hearing, where you're supposed to go back over in front of people, discuss uh, what the technology is, what the impacts are, take the feedback, come back, take a considered view. Uh, there are other processes uh, of constitutional processes where you need to get consent. So there is the Panchayat Extension Schedule Areas Act, uh, now the Forest Rights Act, but there is elaborate process of consent. But then you also have something called the Cabinet Committee on Investments, which says, my God, your processes are going to take really long. We don't have, we as a country have no time to wait for it. So if you're going to take long, all these processes are going to be cut short. Uh, they're all already challenged. Uh, it's not like public hearings really take place well. Uh, there's huge, huge conflict there. Uh, there's a lot of roughshodness uh, in, in, in the way these, these processes are uh, held. The maximum you stretch transparency is to that we'll upload it on the website. Uh, you know, that, that's how it's really spread, uh, uh, stretches. Of course, litigation has, uh, you know, there are orders which say, you know, whenever you get a clearance. Now there's a, now there's a latest uh, uh, order of the National Green Tribunal which says, the moment you give an environmental clearance, the entire environment clearance should be published in the newspaper. Now, these are, these are things that don't happen. That is one thing. There are, these, there are these instances where some of these transparent processes are supposed to be put in place. But as I said, maximum it is stretched now is to put things up on the website. But then, this, this process of engagement and transparency, I think, will, will be, even if you want to uh, stretch it, will happen only if you don't have this, uh, this sword hanging on your head. That if you're going to delay, you know, we're going to say cut it short and, uh, you know, Everything else can, you know, can be just kept aside. So the speed, the, the, the country current, I don't think the, the government is really willing to engage with the process of whether it's transparency or anything like that. You can put up something on the website and not wait for anybody. What's the point? You know, I'll tell you. I'll tell you that this is the reason I've ta I'm taking a decision, but nobody has the time to respond to it, to engage with it. You know, uh, so that's, that's um, others might want to add to it. Uh, I'll just start with transparency also from an urban point of view. In Mumbai, we have the sea link, the Bandra Worli sea link, if some of you are from Bombay might know. It's to connect, uh, uh, you know, part of the suburbs with downtown, with, with, uh, with South Bombay. It's a project in which I don't think, you all might know better, but, you know, it's about uh, where uh, the transparency was not visible in terms of uh, were the people even asked if they need such a thing. It's, it's, it's not through that kind of citizenry con uh, uh, consensus making that has to happen, where people should be consulted if they need it, and what can be done about traffic system. Perhaps, yes, many of them would have said that, yes, it's a good project, but such a process also is not undertaken in the first place. Secondly, it's a, proje uh, it's a project which was floated out supposedly to complete in three years with 700 crore rupees as a budget. It took us 10 years and rupees 2100 crore rupees. Was there any public outcry about it? No. It was still the taxpayers' money that was going on. Now that you are on that uh, ceiling, I cannot access it because I don't have a car on my own. There is no bus going. I just heard recently maybe there's a bus, but then I, I, I don't think so. Bikers, any of you here, you all cannot go. Because why the government fears that you're going to do rash driving. Pedestrians are not allowed because then they might just kill themselves by jumping off. And then a toll is 75 rupees, which is high. It's like equivalent of, I mean, in value about like $40 or something. And, and nobody's protesting that. So my money has gone into that definitely, but without my permission, and I cannot even use it in that way. So where is the public outcry, even in urban areas for that? The transparency, even to question that, I mean, I'm looking at that point of view of transparency that even the public is not pressuring for a transparency in those systems and processes. Next question. One thing that is... It's on. It's on. What is obvious is that this is, seems to be a battle between David and Goliath. The true do-gooders, environmentalists, who are doing it out of selflessly are so um, 
devoid of power that it almost looks like a um, foregone conclusion as to who will be the victor. Greed, it seems, finds its level at odd level. And greed is not just that of monetary greed, the power, the, the becoming a leader, that's also a greed factor. And there are those greedy people on both sides. What seems to be important is to find even one example of development or industrialization that has been done in the right way so that at least we can say there is a way to take in, um, protect both interests. If there is no such example, then it is either this or that, and guess what? Development is going to be the uh, winner at all costs. So my question is, is there any example, even one, that can be cited as a perfect way to do the development without sacrificing the other issues of environment, culture, religion, and so on and so forth. I think for me the, the question is what is happening today, can we actually call it development? Yeah. And the, it's, I, that's where the terminological difference really comes in. So even in the broadest uh, definition of development is supposed to be, as Parmanju was saying, right? you bring people together, you take a, whatever compromise you come to or whatever trade-off you come to, there is a process by which it is followed. Currently, the, there is one set of people who seem to be convinced that this is the way forward. And it's just, you know, no matter what you're going ahead with. So in this scenario, actually, uh, in, in, this, in, this, in this model of growth or industrialization, I haven't seen anything positive. I think the positive lessons might be in, uh, and that also not perfectly positive because there are hierarchies even within communities. There are many states that operate within communities. I think there are lessons we can draw in terms of how people would uh, organize themselves uh, in say unions or cooperatives and you can add on to that uh, or, or how uh, how common areas in, in, in rural and urban areas are designed and used but in this current model where it's it's a it's a correctly directly thing like certain kinds of land use or certain kinds of uh, uh, ways of being uh, uh, are are the ones which are uh, which are better than the others, that, that conclusion has been arrived at only by a handful of people. I don't think there has been even a process of figuring out that this is the kind of development that we have. Maybe we will finally arrive at that. Maybe everybody in the country will say this is what it is. You know, it's okay to go up that business curve. But I don't think that nobody is waiting for all that. So I, I haven't actually seen in this model uh, anything positive as of now. It's really sad. But Maybe others can, uh, can um, tell me about it, and I'd be happy to know. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I would like to ask people to uh, keep the questions a little short, so that more people can get a chance. Okay, sorry, that had to come after my question, because it's more of a series of questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm uh, Vasundra, I'm with uh, AID. My question is similar to uh, Mr. Prakash. Uh, while we are all here talk, finger pointing at industries and industrialization um, at everyone but ourselves, uh, are we aware that we are clothed, fed, speaking in English, talking, uh, using this mic or using a, a laptop because of uh, some kind of displacement uh, and so my question is like have you people uh, done anything to deal with this to minimize your needs or be an example to us um, like have you stopped eating duck from coming from Gujarat or rice from Chhattisgarh or not living in created your built your own uh, houses and schools uh, it's a you know I'm always perplexed with this. Like, while we are finger pointing, uh, 
are are we minimizing our needs and impacting someone else less? So, so I'm sorry if it's a very immature question, but I always get uh, you know this in my mind. It's a, it's a very personal question, and the personal is political, and the political is personal. I think it, it, I, I came into this country in September, and I'll be leaving in summertime, and uh, where it will be still snowing in Boston, but in Bombay it will be too hot. But when I first came here, I remember this one particular day in the afternoon where on Saturday I wanted to go and have lunch. Before that, I started watching this documentary, Food, Inc., um, it got over in two hours. I'm still hungry, but I didn't know what to eat after that. <laughs> and that's increasingly happening in Bombay too. And um, because I come from Bombay, and thank God we still have those bhaji wala, sabji wala still screaming, charu peta matra, charu peta matra. That's still good. The question is, we are still bargaining with him. That's also pesticides. But the thing is, in terms of what we are buying, he, uh, we will bargain with him to give it us for three rupees a kilo and not four. We are not bargaining at a Reliance Fresh or something else, but we are. But increasingly, cities are going there. Uh, I think about what choices we make are very, very personal, and it it hits on our face every time. But it's uh, revolution is an everyday thing, ever changing thing. It's never going to be one permanent answer. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the answer will have to come from yourself. <laughs> Your own choice. Yeah, I, um, I think the question is is important. I mean, it's critical to always be reflecting upon what one does in one's own life. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to make a small distinction about about the personal and the political. I mean, I kind of uh, I agree with what you're saying, but uh, also the thing is, um, I think individual actions have far less. Um, of an impact, or have, I mean, carry that much less rather than systemic institutional changes. You know, so while we may, all of us, uh, make our own little compromises in terms of what we want to give up, what we want to keep, uh, you know, and we might, we might also suggest that to friends and family. But I think the kind of, uh, the kinds of messages that we put out uh, in a public sphere um, in terms of what kind of institutional and political changes that we want, which will actually make it possible for more and more of us to make those changes in our own personal lives. Like, for example, in living in the city of Delhi, I cannot make the choice of cycling. I just cannot, all right? It needs a systemic change. It needs a political change to make that possibility even be realized by people like me. So I think... So while, on one hand, we will sort of, uh, you know, try and deal with uh, uh, the kinds of choices we make in our personal lives, there is clearly that public space that needs to be changed in, in, in the way it's managed. Uh, like, for example, the cooperative movement has almost died in India. And that's because policies have made it almost impossible for cooperatives to be set up and function in a beneficial sort of way. Similarly, the decentralization of uh, decentralized government uh, uh, projects or programs that encouraged it have almost declined. I mean, they were they were very strong in the early 90s. They've almost gone. This and it clearly points out to how policy making at the central level or at the state level has been so prejudiced against these other ways of living that for a number of people actually making that shift to another way of life is almost impossible. I, if I want organic food, I have to be able to pay three times the price. And that's not, that's not feasible for most people. I just want to very briefly say, I can assure you they're all dealing with our schizophrenic existence. <laughs> okay, I mean, we are, the very fact that we're choosing to even engage with these realities is, is a choice that has been made. We are all dealing with the fact that, you know, what 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 what, what paper cup I'm using, etc. We're we are all we're all dealing with that. But we are that that's where Manju is saying, you know, like how do you link you do make consider continue to make those personal choices. I we all go and work in places, come back and see you know, go straight. We are part of families which take you to a shopping mall straight. 
But these are things, these are struggles of everyday living, which I think, I can assure you, everybody is dealing with it. Uh, maybe not as well as other, some other people, but we are all struggling with it. Uh, and we are all trying to make those uh, changes little by little, everywhere. Yeah. Join the skills of Freddie Kula. <laughs> I have to come in on the same topic. Like, when fighting such powerful opponents, I don't think there's anything wrong in using the most, every modern tool that we have at our disposal to change the future course of society. I think we should use this. Computer, it's the means and ends debate. I mean, the verdict is open. <laughs> and my question is regarding the, you said it's very hard to enforce the law and to make sure that they are compliant, the corporations are compliant. So is it possible to file a public interest litigation and tie up the process so that at least people, they can fight for it? Or is it, has it been successful at any point or does it work? Or? Yeah, for, what? for any project, I mean, you can file a PIL for that project saying that, okay, they're not, I mean, following the law, so how do, how does that work, or is it even possible? And, yeah, that's it's not No, I think uh, there is, as Manju said, litigation is definitely uh, is some, a tool that, in the short term, lots of people are using, whether it is an issue of bad process of approvals, or issues of compliance and monitoring. But while you're dealing with one project after the other, you know, uh, and you deal with the issues of how, how can you prove scientifically this or that. We've all been, the study she was talking about was exactly this. We actually went down investigating some of these projects, saying that our conditions being really complied with, because we didn't want to stop at the point the approval was given. The, the damage actually takes place after. So really actually seeing, you know, and the, the, the approvals have a clear condition saying that if any of these above are not met, the clearance can be revoked. But the question is whether the compliance and monitoring framework today is being rendered inefficient. So how much how much are 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 the political process or the policy process ensuring that the compliance and monitoring processes are strengthened? For instance, if any company was supposed to give a six monthly compliance report, submits a six monthly compliance report, and in that compliance report there are twenty conditions. And the response is complied, 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 will be complied, to be complied, that's accepted. A following one month later, a monitoring report of the Ministry of Environment and Forest comes in. It says, as per the compliance report, it is complied, so it is complied. <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're actually, and even if there's a show cause notice issued, there is no follow through. So one of the projects that we've been, we've been trying to do some a community-led ground truthing exercise, where, it's not me who goes in and goes and finds out and finds a litigation, but it's a constant engagement. It's, and there have been cases that are, there are being filed, not necessarily in courts, but also with the regulatory authorities. Because the first level of action that you're seeking is with the Ministry of Environment and Forest, or the Pollution Control Board, which is something like the EPA here. So you're, you're actually ensuring that before you go into any court action, let's get, get this sorted. You have the authority to say, if any of the conditions are not complied with, you, you have the authority to revoke that clearance. So that level of engagement has happened tremendously. But problem with some of those compliance issues is where it is stark, where it's land use change, etc. If you can prove it with pictures, etc. But some of the other things where it's more scientific thing, uh, arguments that uh, you have crossed pollution parameters up to uh, uh, noise pollution parameters or air pollution parameters, you will have your own modeling, the other side comes up with their own modeling. And it's up to the court then to decide whose modeling is better. And those are the kind of debates people have gotten stuck with. Or they'll say, okay, it's okay, um, you know, we will, you, you've done this so far, but you made a mistake, but now put up a, a new uh, flu glass, the, the flu gas desulfurization plant, etc., etc., and it's a solid argument. What about something that's black and white, like the displacement aspect of it? Like you, you, you I mean, are you providing them the compensation when they're displacing? The Narmada has been going on for how many years? <laughs> it's, it's not. It's impossible to tie it in the court. Like it, it is possible it's being tied up at least to an extent at various, at various steps. Is there anything else? No, there are. Litigation is going on. So the question is, does it stall the process sufficiently that it allows you room for additional action, or do, is it just delaying the inevitable? I don't think it's delaying the inevitable. I mean, I just always hope that the delays will lead to something, at least in some instances. That's why people are engaging with all kinds of political, social, legal 
you know, all the jugad is possible in the, on the planet that you can keep going on with. I think that's why, and also to prove, if you get one such case where you, instead of us getting tired, the corporation gets tired, you know, it's one such case, maybe it'll be a case in point. It kind of, invariably it's the other way around. You know, you, the whole set of the movement gets tired. Uh, environmentalist is so Costco in other cases is actually that the energies have all come in to see how much it can be pushed. Uh, so I think and that's as a classic case of so many energies at so many levels, not just litigation. That litigation could have gone really wrong. I think uh, we can discuss how what what really went in favor of that litigation, but it could have really gone wrong, and then it would have been a counter. The court has allowed it. Go ahead. That's that's the fear in many cases that sometimes it can backfire completely. Uh, when a judge decides to uh, extend his privileges and talk about uh, how different people should live and what what kinds of aspirations they should and should not have, I mean they can exceed their powers. I mean by far. And then you know you 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 have such a strong backlash uh, to a case like that that uh, it impinges on other freedoms that may have that may have existed before the court case uh, took place. Yes, hello, my name is Sushmita, and I was fortunate enough to live in Mumbai for two years recently. And it's a little different question. I attended some meetings of the Green, Indian Green Building Council and the clean tech uh, entrepreneurs, and I find that they are also pretty passionate and quite knowledgeable. So are they part of your team to you know, bring change, bring positive change? That's my question. I think it really depends on the kind of work you are doing right now. If you're, you know, uh, there is there are issues of urban development, uh, real estate, the, uh, making green buildings. So I think there are people we know who are definitely part of doing that work. Uh, that's not been uh, maybe that's not really been the focus of I think my work. I can say that is our work. We've been trying to uh, this this rural urban connect is is what we've been talking talking about the. Uh, rural policy connect is what we've been working on, which was what we presented. So there are maybe not that 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 those those are people, but there are other people who are working on efficiency, uh, reducing impacts, green architects. We are all in touch with them. It doesn't necessarily mean we are all meet, meeting and uh, working all the same time. So like there is there is a whole bunch of uh, radical architects in India who we deal with, who who are very interested in these these questions, not just in buildings, but how to redesign urban space completely. So it's not just making it uh, building efficient. Uh, so they're, they're part of the larger uh, network, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next. <coughs> Hi, um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is sort of uh, based upon what Manju said earlier about culture no longer being an ally in the Indian context sort of to fight for the environment. But what we have seen in the on, on the ground, of course, is that uh, you know, there's a proliferation of certain kind of identity politics. And it's very successful also sometimes, right? Um, the case of Vedanta, the recent case, you know, the, the Dogriya Gons really organized well, and, you know, it was all about the Niyamgiri mountain, how sacred it was, etc. And, you know, it was successful in the sense that the project was suspended because of some divestment that happened in the UK. So, you know, one can understand the appeal for groups on the ground when they see success like this to say, you know, this is a good route to argue a case. So, for example, right now in one uh, campaign that we're involved in, the anti pasco campaign, the Pauri Buya in the Khandadar region are very interested in, therefore, pursuing that as an avenue of, you know, working against this project. Well, the issue, of course, for everybody is the issue of economic rights. Um, so, in that context, and I think, you know, specifically speaking in an international context, we're organizing internationally, that kind of uh, sort of appeal to certain kind of primitivism or you know uh, certain kind of glorification of tribal identity has a lot of play. So what do you therefore do when you are organizing internationally? So what you all observe on the ground? What kind of strategies can we, can we use to organize but not sort of fall into this? Mm -hmm. uh, that's one question. The second question was, I just read a couple of days ago that uh, the government of India, so there's already pre-existing legislation about you know uh, rights of tribal communities and the rights to give permission in the use of particular kinds of land. 
I uh, read that the government of India in its petition to the Supreme Court uh, voluntarily retreated on these existing legislation and said, uh, in, in, you know, accepting these very, very extreme cases, it's actually okay for the tribal community not to give permission. So when the government of India itself treating on its, uh, you know, promises and existing law, uh, given what you said about, uh, you know, the role of the judiciary, the unreliable role of the judiciary, uh, what other, you know, spaces exist to organize against is to hold the government of India to its own constitution, if not judicially, right? So, and one quick comment I wanted to make, it has felt something someone said a while ago, which is that the, the fight between science and religion is over. I mean, hardly, right? Uh, in the West, I mean, in the U.S. in particular, I mean, more so than Europe, I think, we, it's in the newspaper headlines every single day. Uh, I mean, you know, talk about stopping, not funding stem cell therapy, talk about all kinds of employers refusing to give contraception because of their religious beliefs. So I think that is hardly over. So I just wanted to make that comment. Sorry about that, but thank you. Yeah. Um, I think you've... Uh, You've clearly um, sort of stated uh, what actually I was talking about as a problem, that in case we do not want to use culture as an ally by sort of um, over-romanticizing tribal ways of life or uh, sort, of, um, sort of trapping um, farmers as particular kinds of people who are tied to their land and therefore not having aspirations of doing anything else, then I think we do run the risk of making short-term gains, maybe, but it, it's definitely going to come back and bite us in the back uh, a little later because, because things are so much in a state of flux uh, because of the kinds of new opportunities that have become available. And people have different, uh, uh, people have very different judgments about what these new opportunities are. Some, some of us may say that it's, it's utterly, um, uh, you know, uh, deplorable what the state of affairs has been. There's no clean air, there's no this and that. But for many others, jobs may be important. Education facilities may be very important. So actually, I think the, I find it, uh, I find it a lot, of, lot more satisfying and certainly a lot more honest to take the long-winded route uh, to actually have those detailed, complex, uh, you know, different points of view being voiced and all of that stuff. Not that we've had a great chance at, you know, experimenting with this because there is no time, like Anchi said. We're, all of us are on the treadmill and you have to keep moving uh, from one case to another, from one project to another, from one place to another if you want to, if you want to sort of reach out to people and, and, try, and uh, try and do this, this kind of work. But I think had we had the luxury of time, this is what I would I would definitely take that route much more than uh, trying to make those short term gains because I find that um, I find that you know in all my interactions with people in different places whether it's the the time I spent in the northeast uh, mostly Arunachal and Sikkim or the time that I've spent in other places where we've uh, looked at these projects and how they impact livelihoods and economic rights as you said they are open to using environment or environmental arguments as a tool to make a case uh, for protecting certain kinds of rights at this point of time. They are not necessarily committing to it for life. Because nobody really knows what, what, what kinds of opportunities are going, to go, are going to open up for you. Small entrepreneurs, for example, like in Kutch, uh, where we've been doing this work for some time, there are a large number of salt pan workers who are actually doing pretty good. I mean, they earn, they make about a crore a year um, in terms of profits. And that's not entirely without its environmental impacts, if one were to, if one were to strictly assess it. But, I mean, they've, they've sort of struck some sort of a balance between how to make a living and at the same time how to try and keep certain kinds of spaces, uh, you know, as they may have been, as mangroves or as spaces for uh, drinking water and stuff like that. So my concern has always been only with this, you know, trapping people in particular categories in order to make the environmental case, which at some point will break open, and then we won't probably know how to deal with that. Um, so, sorry, second 
Can I just add to that a little bit? Uh, in Assam, we have we are having the Lower Subanshri Dam project coming up. And there is a great resistance, and in a way, it's a very successful. It had been a very successful resistance because um, since the end of December uh, 2011 to uh, April 2012, uh, people over there had occupied this, the 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 main road leading to the dam and had stopped every NHPC car going in there with supplies. 70% of the dam has already been built. But the problem is in those different identities in Assam. You have the Mishin community who have their leadership. You have all Assam Students Union. And then you have the Adivasis who are in Assam's context. As they say, it is different from indigenous people. So Mishin would be indigenous, but Adivasis would be the tea garden laborers who are there, but who have been, who had been brought during the British times from central India to work there. They do not seem to be coming together on a platform. And so how do we then strengthen that leadership? You know, how do we get them all? Because when the dam has come, when, the, when there is a big earthquake, you know, the, the floods are not going to see if the person is Mishing or Adivasi. Right? So that's the thing that we have to also see. And also going back to what Vasundara was also pointing about, you know, we're talking about English and all of that, in, I mean, in, in English. Most of the literature then does not go back down to the local languages where it could be helpful. In Gujarat, there are seven dams, in South Gujarat, there are seven dams coming up on seven different rivers. The people who are going to be affected heard about it the last. Because everything was in the paperwork was in that in, in English, you know. So I think again, it's about dealing with all those many multi uh, issues about languages and cultures and bringing all of that together too. Uh, I'll just quickly deal with the second part of your question. There. I think uh, the whole issue of dilution of consent, which is basically the affidavit that has been filed by the Ministry of Environment in the Vedanta case in the Supreme Court. Uh, I don't think the government of India is in odds with its own people, but I think it's in odds within its own self. So, what is what constitutes government of India? It's Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Tribal Affairs. Each one trying to represent its constituency. So the late this actually is part of uh, uh, the uh, a circular which with the Ministry of Environment came up in in, in to, to July two thousand nine, August two thousand nine, where it said no forest land will be diverted for non-forest use unless the rights of the forest dwelling community under the Forest Rights Act is settled or is recognized. It was as simple. And within that they said, before you do that, you need to take consent of the Gram Sabha. That they put it in that circular. Now, the Ministry of Tribal Affairs and the Ministry of Environment are holding on to that for a while. And there is huge pressure from the other constituents of the government. It's their negotiation. It's not negotiation, it's not a trade-off between uh, people and the government. It is the trade-off between government and government. That's saying that we'll allow for consent for these kinds of projects, but not those kinds of projects. That is their trade-off that is taking place. So, what has happened in the Vedanta case and Vedanta case, they've actually argued very clearly that you, the, the the parameters you use to go ahead with the Prosper project are the same parameters you use to stop Vedanta. So, you know, these trade-offs are then being used and argued in court against each other. So that's what that's what the whole thing is. It's a constant negotiation, I think, within within the various constituencies of the government to arrive at a compromise formula amongst themselves. So, uh, so we have about four more questions. Um, people already have their fingers, uh, hands up. And after that, uh, you know, feel free to stick around and talk to the panelists until they are absolutely hungry and have to leave. <laughs> um, Hi, I'm not that familiar with the Indian Constitution, but um, one of the interesting trends that's happening around the world in one country, in particular Ecuador, Ecuador recently recognized nature itself. Um, it gave rights to nature itself, the Ecuadorian Constitution. And I'm just curious how far along India might be on that path. <laughs> South America, there has already been a very long-standing, uh, you know, process of the indigenous peoples there coming together, uh, making assertions about uh, their identity and coming together, which we do not have. India is a very racist country in that. 
so um, you know so uh, they already have that homework that was done like several several decades ago um, we are many decades away until we it's it's like only until the whole thing has been crashed and burned after it has settled down then we can think about it I mean that's a very pessimistic way of looking at it, but we we do not have that that indigenous struggle that going. It, it's going on now, but it has been kind of more united in the South Americas. Are there coalitions being built in India to? Oh yes, there's a lot of that. In fact, I I I, I want to draw your attention to maybe this last from photographs there. It's about a tribal rally in Bombay. It's very interesting that 25,000 people gathered on the streets of Bombay after having walking around the state of Maharashtra for 15 days to press for the implementation of the Forest Rights Act, which grants them the land deeds on the forest patches of land that they have been working on. Uh, in the role of an independent journalist, sometime in Bombay, when we organize, you know, some political events like um, more like dem demonstrations and all of that. 200 people sign up on Facebook, say they are coming, just 15 turn up, and then within 15 minutes we are rounded up by the cops. But this was an amazing show of real democracy and people coming together because they had police protection. It was well planned. And at various stages of those 14 days, the ministers had urged them not to come down to Bombay because they knew that then they are going to have it from their seniors because I'm mean, to question what's happening with the implementation of FRA. So there is a lot of movement internally that is going on, but it doesn't seem to be enough because on the other hand, you have the other side which just is, you know, just looks down upon them and then what, what they are saying is rubbish for, 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 for the ones who are reaping the fruits of uh, quote-unquote development. Uh, there are there are there are constitutional fundamental rights which uh, which uh, are, they don't articulate the whole natural justice argument or right to nature kind of argument but they have been used even in litigation to extend it to uh, there is right to nature but I think uh, I think India as a country is so calm. some of the things that Manji was also talking about nature itself is viewed very differently some are, some people associated with land others are living. Uh, it's, it's very much more complex to deal with some of these issues. Uh, technically, right to nature probably would be also you don't pollute the farming or you don't, you know, it's, you can really stretch it. It'll, so I think the debate definitely needs to come in and probably the rights uh, debate might not be the best way to go about it, uh, but uh, I think responsibilities, uh, re-engaging with nature to some extent might be required for that. Hi, um, my question is for Manju, and uh, I mean, um, I think I'm a little ill-informed in this, uh, so please like, don't take offense. If it is. So you were talking about people actually having the sense of ownership and belonging to a certain place, right? Um, and I, what I see is a bunch of people sitting here who actually are like very different from their place, but they are still concerned. Uh, they, they have their own concerns about the environment in India and so on and stuff. That's one thing. And I do see the correlation between belonging to a certain region and its welfare. Um, but I also see things like, um, you know, uh, say, Jai Maharashtra, or, you know, being you know, people yeah. like laborers from Bihar being killed in Assam or anywhere else. So it's not that the sense of ownership is lacking or the sense of belonging is lacking in people. Uh, my question to you would be, do you think uh, that's, that, that sense of ownership, uh, you know, is, is basically, the lack of sense of ownership is basically, you know, kind of not helping you with your cause, or is it the complete lack of ability of people to understand or comprehend, you know, how, you know, these things are, you know, their environment is being affected, and do you think it's more of a lack of awareness? Or is it more because they don't have a sense of ownership of the, you know, the place that they live in? My question to you is that. Yeah. I'll, just, I'll just sort of clarify what I was trying to say uh, when I made that point, which is that um, I think that the issue of attachment to land is overemphasized in many of the environmental issues. And 
that to an extent, uh, to some extent, now creates a problem because most people are not living in the place where they were born, or they are not living in the place where they can stake a claim uh, to having been there for generations because of processes like migration and and moving for employment or whatever. So what I was trying to say is that new environmental movements, which are sort of uh, trying to look at issues of urbanization or trying to look at issues of uh, of how um, certain spaces, whether they are workspaces or whether they are uh, living spaces, dwelling spaces, the way they are planned, do people who do not belong to that area, do they get a chance to actually participate in these movements? Or are these movements meant only for people who can claim and who can give evidence for these attachments to land. Because if, if our environmental movements are premised on attachments to land, then it means that a large number of people who are not living in the places where they actually belong uh, do, not have, do not have a right to participate in those movements and do not have any possibilities of staking a claim to that environment. That's, that's what I meant. And, you know, it's... it's I mean, we, it's, it's happened so often uh, and so unfortunately in India that um, environmental movements almost closely uh, partner with the kinds of organizations that you mentioned where there is a certain kind of very conservative politics that seeks to throw out outsiders without necessarily realizing that they are poor people who have actually come to make a living in a city and people in the city actually depend on them to get menial jobs done. And these are all the effects of globalization. I mean, globalization has actually uh, uh, cut down barriers to movement of labor, right? So we actually need Bangladeshi migrants to do most of our household work and all of that stuff. But when it comes to giving them a, clear, a, a, a stake in environment, movements like the environment, which are premised on attachments to land, they don't stand a chance at all. That's what I was trying to say. I, mean, I, just thought, I was just thinking about everything. Yeah. 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 Hi, uh, I am Shashi. Uh, so imagine that you have infinite power, right? So what are the things <laughs> <laughs> that you would do uh, so, so, so that you will be happy kind of thing, right? Because, <laughs> because like coming back to Vasu's question, right? Even it's hard for me uh, to decide on what things to use and what not to use. Like if I just leave this, leave that, leave that and go back, then what I imagine is that picture over there with the bullock cuts, right? That's something which is sustainable, at least for me, right? I want to know what your perspective is. Like what is the idealistic solution for you? <laughs> He's assuming that if you have power, you will work towards the solution. <laughs> Whereas actually, power corrupts, no? And total power corrupts totally or completely. How does the saying go? Yeah. I mean, if we had total power, I don't think we'd be working towards the solution. The fun is in not having the power and fighting it out. <laughs> Actually, trying to get towards yes. Top three ideas from each person. Top three. Give us a year to prepare. You know, I just, I, I think for me, see, this is what I was talking about. Remember, I told you, make us dance on our head. This is what I meant. I, I think. Uh, you get the special. I think. Uh, Rather than look for solution, I for me, if I have power, uh, even if it corrupts me, I think I'll just probably say let's freeze for the world. Let's just freeze and all of us just re-engage with uh, some of these fundamental questions. I don't think anybody is waiting to engage with these questions. I think the policy is so convinced about what they're doing. Uh, it's time to confuse it a little, uh, make it a little unsure. Maybe we'll come out with some solution. I cannot claim to have the solution. I will not claim to also have the solution, because, but I will claim to say that, yes, there are there are lessons from really uh, grassroots stuff, uh, movements that are taking place. There are also some very interesting thinking that is taking place, which needs to be combined. 
and we'll probably need to just freeze for a couple of years and re-engage with these questions rather than running, running after a chasing something which is, which I don't know what, I, you know, there is a conviction that we're chasing something. And, you know, it's like, breathe. Let's just take take a step, breathe, let's re-engage with what has happened, let's re-engage, maybe, maybe, maybe collectively there'll be a, there'll be a solution that will come out of it. I, I cannot definitely claim to have that, even if I have the power. I just want to go back home. Sleeping peacefully, having known that I've eaten healthy food, healthy water, without having hurt anyone, without being hurt. And learning that I have been respected as much as I respect someone else. It sounds very philosophical and very much like sitting in the mountain instead of this room. But literally, I think it just goes back to that. At least for me. This only because I'm being pushed. <laughs> um, but um, I mean, I think uh, I think for me, one of the greatest problems uh, that I recognize uh, is the weight of um, a government that seems to think that um, it has to think on behalf of all of us. And as a result of which, although we have been granted rights and privileges and all of that stuff, it's not, it's not actually possible for us to exercise those rights in any meaningful ways. Um, like, for example, spaces are so constricted that we can't make different uses of it. Um, opportunities for work are so limited that it, no matter how much we hate um, slave labor, we have to end up go. Uh, we have to end up working in certain kinds of, in certain kinds of contexts or certain kinds of situations. Or then you just to choose to opt out, and then you are then in the alternative space. You know, uh, which actually has its own intense challenges because those alternative spaces have to compete with a lot of the other mainstream uh, uh, processes. And in the, within within the same space, it's not like it's not like uh, we free up certain opportunities so that different groups of people can experiment with different kinds of living. So what I what I might actually um, sort of um, think about is how we can try and get um, you know government to try and play less and less of a role in. Uh, everyday decision making that we have to make about how we want to live rather than deciding for us that we need those highways or that we need uh, a certain kind of development in order to be able to um, it just assumes you know that all of us have similar aspirations and all of us want to live a, a certain kind of lifestyle and so we have those projections that we like for example the Ministry of Power says that we can't do any cherry picking in terms of whether we'll choose renewables or we'll choose hydro or we'll choose nuclear. We need all of it because everyone needs so much, so much, so much electricity in order to survive. And it's, it's, it's actually a very difficult argument to get around because what they're actually doing is just aggregating per capita uh, power consumption uh, uh, with the population. And that, that's, that's really not the way to try and understand how people live or how they want to live. Uh, I, I don't know how to go beyond this. Yeah, it's like more local involvement rather than the national. And... Yeah, yeah, but you know, what I'm saying is that trying out different kinds of things is becoming difficult. Uh, because there are these intense restrictions of how um, you know, everyone's life is already mapped in a certain sort of way. You know that uh, this is the amount of power you will use. This is the amount of uh, this is the amount. This is the distance you will travel to work every day. It almost seems like you know you're you're almost trapped in a certain kind of life, and it's very difficult to break out of that until those spaces are actually made available. Well, having said that, I mean, when you say it's local and we keep on using the word we, 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 of course, we have the RTI. How many of us maybe even try, are trying to invoke that for even the most local areas of our, our, of our wards or wherever we are living in, our, in, in, in India? 
and I think it still can be done from here also RTI or at least I, I mean I mean we are all talking about we'll have to look at it but then personally all of us can do and we'll have to do it. I mean that's the only way I feel because otherwise it's just always seen to be you know the preaching activist kind of thing as you said uh, it, and then it just shirks off the whole responsibility. Sorry, so we have a one quick comment and then one quick question and then we can you know, open it for everybody to meet. Just a quick, is it on? Yeah. A quick recommendation of an article, because I know it seems like many people are sort of wrestling with the question of, you know, uh, making personal choices. So this article is called, Forget Shorter Showers. Um, and, and, and basically, and, and the tagline is, why personal change is not a substitute for political change. Uh, for those who are on the aid list, I posted this on the list many years ago, but it should still be there. But you can just Google, forget shorter showers. It's not about all of us taking shorter showers. It's about larger choices like earlier, you know, the panelists were saying. So thanks for that. Um, so I just want to first of all thank you for the nuanced kind of approach that you bring to thinking about kind of environmental um, policy and advocacy in India and, and I really like the, the thought of thinking about multiple rights and trying to figure out how to balance the needs of multiple stakeholders and finding the right balance in the middle. Um, and given if you had two years to just pause, maybe that would be possible, mm -hmm. right? But even if you were able to get everyone to agree on something and then find a compromise that seems somewhere in the middle, then perhaps then, then you would have a solution where people, um, where all the stakeholders would be invested and so there would actually be enforcement of, of the, the agreements that people come to. But, what seemed to me the biggest issue from what every, every one of you said was that even when agreements are made, there's no enforcement or compliance with them. And so what is it that you think are promising strategies to just get people to do what they agree to? You know, and, and you know, what, what it is, whether it's right or not, whether it meets the needs of all the stakeholders or not, when people come to an agreement, how do you actually get people to actually follow through? I think uh, some of these uh, some of these questions were, were what the uh, the movement for decentralized governance was actually trying to wrestle with, which is that you might have a possibility of improving compliance of any kind, or compliance to any kind of agreement, if uh, it's, it's, being, it's all being done, the action is all happening at a local level, where you actually by face know who the person is who is in charge of getting something done. Of course, I mean, it does require uh, mobilizations of some sort because um, it's not always easy uh, for people say maybe of a lower caste or a lower c class to to raise certain questions or to ask certain questions or demand certain actions of people in power but with those kinds of mobilizations uh, taking place on the ground um, it's always uh, it seems much much more plausible to imagine that compliance may be possible to achieve if you know by name and by face the people who are actually in charge of doing this and if you can walk up to their office and tell them and repeatedly tell them or badger them about how they ought to get out and get those things done. But when the distance between government and people is just way too much, uh, there's, there's, there's illusionment. I mean, you can, you can try writing letters and all of us may have done that, may have been involved in that kind of action at some point or the other, right? Where you keep writing letters and then there seems to be no response, then you try a, a letter with an acknowledgement due, the acknowledgement comes back, but then you never really get a response. So, and, and you feel somewhat powerless because of that distance, you know, you really can't 
um, ever get an appointment with this person in power. So I think when it's a lot more localized, I think the possibilities are seem to be much higher, to me at least. Adding to that, uh, like how do you decide whether a nuclear power in Kerala is going to solve the problem or a hydro project in Andhra is going to solve? And you have a local decentralized government. How do you decide between those as who sacrifices for the requirement of the power of the nation? I mean, for the electricity for the whole country? How does that how does it solve that problem? Let's put the country. Let's put the country. Let's put the world, that's where the world <laughs> is going, right? I mean, Sorry? In, in defense of technology, that's where the world is going. We're getting more distributed. And I just read, uh, what's the guy's, uh, the third industrial revolution uh, about a Africa being the. In the past, everything was centralized. Knowledge, everything was centralized. And we headed toward a decentralized system, and so we we getting there. No, but how do you decide? Who decides a power project in, Ke uh, in uh, a nuclear project in Kerala or a hydro project in Andhra? I mean, there, there because the sacrifices at both ends. That's true. There are two aspects of the de decision, right? Once the knowledge base that you, the empowerment of, of acquiring what the decision process requires. So uh, there are a lot of things we talked over here, and I think time is one thing that just you know I've seen my own life uh, when I was very young uh, in India. People used to say there's so many colleges, and every guy who's a graduate is, is a bus driver. And then, come, you know, 20 years later, we, we don't have enough graduates left. So things that look good, look bad at one point, suddenly become better sometime later. So time is a way of, of sort of overcoming some of these things. So you know, I think technology is heading the right way for decentralization, and and that's where we're getting to a network society where uh, I think democracy is, is going to change. It's going to be uh, an, an instantaneous democracy, maybe off Facebook or whatever it is. But yeah, but I think we need. I think we we'll need um, several, several different kinds of experiments to figure out what yeah. what kinds of systems actually work. It may not be one thing that works over all others, but we may actually have a whole set of ideas that, that work. But those experiments have to be done. I mean, it's important. I, that's what I'm saying, you know, in the early 90s, many of these experiments were being started, <coughs> and it would have gained ground had it not been for the strange turn that... that uh, you know, that uh, that took place where industrialization at all costs just completely sort of uh, uh, ran over all of these other possibilities. So those experiments will have to be done. It's still due. Uh, may I quickly butt in when you're talking about how we make those choices? In Assam, the lower Subarishi Dam that's coming up. No, I'm, I'm not talking about, sorry, not how we are making the choices at present. I know it's Political, uh, who has what political choice do you make about like yeah yeah I I I can only give by examples because I've not done theoretical study but it's only what I've heard from people in Lower Subarishi Dam uh it's it's one of the most contested dams among the other dams being built in Arunachal Pradesh I think there are 105 dams being built in that small tiny state yeah so um uh, and and that's the part of the <laughs> yeah. It's, but it's on the map. I mean, everyone's like looking at it. It's like most people. I mean, I'm called Chinese. I'm from Assam. So I'm just trying to talk it from that point of view with stereotypical point of view. Um, uh, in, uh, so for this lower uh, Subarshi Dam, what's happened is that it's it's in one of those most fragile areas which is seismically prone all the time. And there are many, obviously, environment issues. Everyone knows about that. When I spoke to the CEO of NHPC who is based there, he said that this is for electricity needs. Assam is known to have like very bad electricity uh, supply all the time. Uh, so I asked him, so it's definitely to counter the, you know, because Assam needs that electricity. And it's definitely a hydro project for the same purpose. He said, no, Assam is getting just 8% of that. Everything else is going to North India. And I asked him, why isn't Assam getting it? Because the Assam government did not bid for it. So it's not a need-based, it's not a need-based project. It's it's just a project created and anyone can start like bargaining for it. So it's not the project that's come because Assam needs it and design. So the only way I was trying to address is to say that we are looking at how how needy is it to have a hydro project? Do we even need to have the one? Your, your question about uh, when decisions are taken locally, will local priorities actually match national or global priorities? Right? The fact is, we are also committed to global and national priorities. Uh, so it's actually it's 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 actually a complete re-engagement with the thinking that maybe maybe you don't need either. 
uh, if you look at, if you if you re-engage re with some of those larger questions that we've been dealing with, whether it's uh, how much per capita uh, electricity does the country require, or if per, the aggregation itself is different. The aggregation is based on the parameters, not of me sitting in Delhi, uh, but the aggregation is based on some other parameter globally. So, and then the, then the nation will probably look, national requirement itself will look different. So it's 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 the aggregating from the local, not aggregating from uh, from the city itself, you know, or, or, the, or the global itself. How much uh, packaging is it required to really try and get all the produce here to the US from India, which even when I travel here I can use. You know, so I mean, it's it's those the question itself needs to be reversed. And I think the other, I think that you know the maybe a little humor in which we how do you make compliance work? We, you know, globally and not just in India. We love breaking rules, right? So it's it's not just environmental. We love breaking traffic rules and just pay off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the environment protection agency here will clearly very clearly say that the compliance situation here is pretty dismal. And that's, I've been speaking to them because I've been here on some comparative research. It's not like it's great here. Uh, so, but that's the but how much is the rule of law respected? Is, is the is the is the is the question, and sometimes I mean I have cousins who take pride in breaking the law. We've been talking about it. I mean, yeah. So how do you deal with that? That that's an ethos, right? It's a way of being that you're dealing. You can get around it. Yeah. It's, whether it's a large industry or it's a traffic violation, the, the the fear of law is not there, and that's not to say the law is solving the problem. It's how it's how you deal with uh, a situation. And I think compliance will only take place if there is some some uh, behavioral change. I think somewhere that will that will uh, need to be brought in. I mean, so what we are saying is it's a whole multitude of uh, dealings while we deal with schizophrenic existence. <laughs> <laughs> so I hate to break up uh, this exciting conversation, but um, we have to actually wrap up at some point. Um, so thank you all for coming and uh, just. Just a point about how to, you know, a lot of these thoughts that need to be put into action at some point. And uh, one of the ways that some of us have been trying to just do a little bit is by volunteering with the uh, Association for India Development. Um, we are a few people around here and with the sign up sheet that was passed around. So we work on, well, we don't work on ourselves, we support people at the grassroots, people like. Um, <laughs> we are just doing the easiest part of the whole work, right? Um, both monetarily and, uh, well, I don't know, moral support. <laughs> and you are, uh, uh, we are, we are uh, different ways of engaging. The, the way aid seems to think about problems is that they are interconnected. All the problems are interconnected. None of this poverty, malnutrition, public health, environment, they exist in isolation as we saw. So we tend to work with different people who work on different spheres. Um, so if you would like to know more about aid, talk to any of us. Um, and uh, the, yeah, another announcement that I would like to make is on March 24th, we are going to have the second event in the series of environment issues. We'll have another two, two activists from India who have been working on um, environmental issues, uh, especially related to food. Uh, and organic movement, etc. So we hope you can come to that event as well. Um, well that's all really I have to say. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. It will be in Milpita's library. Um, and uh, one of the things that, well, we as a aid works on is support from people like you. Um, it's not to say that you should donate or whatever, but uh, we have some calendars here, for example, uh, that this year we are celebrating bicycles as a, as a way of transportation. It's not just it's not just a hippie way of you know, <laughs> biking around, but the, you can see in the calendars the people, the, the way bicycles are used in India in different spheres and how they have been means of livelihoods for people. So we hope you take a look at that. And, um, um, and thank you for coming again. Hand around, we have space, no, I'm not but some of the time, we can have a chair.